The former treatise I have made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day he was taken up. After that, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, having seen of them 40 days, sorry, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the utmost part of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And Lord add his blessing to that reading. So, as you read in verse 12, we are on the Mount of Olives. We are just a few miles east of Jerusalem, and it is now 40 days since Mary Magdalene first came, announcing, being the apostle to the apostles, announcing the news that Christ was alive, that she had seen him. That was 40 days ago. And of course, it's also then been 40 days since the resurrected Lord appeared in a locked room with the 10 disciples, Thomas not having been there. And again, as we just read, gave them many convincing proofs that he was not a ghost, that he was in fact physically resurrected, that he was alive. It's been 32 days since Thomas's great and pitifully overlooked confession that Jesus is and was and is, we should say, both Lord and God. And it has been an unknown number of days, although I would, uh, it feels to me not many. It has been an unknown number of days since Peter was reinstated and the Great Commission was given from an unnamed mountaintop in Galilee. We looked at that just a page over at the end of John's Gospel. It's been 40 days, as Scripture tells us, since Easter Sunday. It's been at least three appearances of the resurrected Lord to the disciples as well as several others, somewhere in here has been that appearance to over 500 brethren, of the once, or 500 brethren at once, as, uh, as Paul later records in 1 Corinthians. But now, the 40 days are up. Today is the day. And Jesus' earthly ministry is at long last finished and complete. He has lived a perfect life in total submission to God the Father, thereby fulfilling the law, so because we could not. He has been obedient even unto death on a cross. He's been raised to life again, as we've said, in a resurrection body and raised by the Father. And now he's given all the convincing proofs, and it's all done. He has run this particular leg of the race. He has fought and won this particular fight, and now it is time for him to return on high from whence he came. But first, however, there is one last thing that needs to be said. There is one final instruction to the disciples to be carried out, and we read it here. They are to go into the city and wait, but not for very long, because not many days from now they are told the Holy Spirit a gift from the Father will come to them, 
And when this happens, they will receive power and they will become witnesses. Witnesses recounting everything that has happened. Now that it's post-resurrection, they couldn't see it before, but now over 40 days it's become clearer and clearer to them how Jesus fulfilled all of the Old Testament scriptures, how he was and is the Messiah, how he is the Son of God, how each and everything that he did, every action, every scene, every word, that we can now go back and, for them, think about, for us, read about in the Gospels, how each and every, the smallest part of Christ's ministry, how it resounded not only throughout the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament, but how it, it attested to him. They can start to see it now. They couldn't before. But over these 40 days, it's become clearer. It's not become entirely clear yet, though. Because perfect clarity, true understanding, is beyond human ability. It requires the presence of Almighty God. It requires the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in them. But we can say that after 40 days, they're much better off than they were. They're no longer hiding. They're no longer locked away. Peter has decided he's not going to quit. Uh, Thomas has decided that not all is lost. But there is... One last thing to do, it's go back and wait. The Holy Spirit will come to them, and when this happens, they will receive power. They need that power in order to become effective witnesses. Because they're not just going to witness to the city of Jerusalem. They're not just going to witness to their immediate neighbors. They are told they're going to leave the city. They're going to witness and give powerful testimony, divinely inspired testimony, to the Judea, to the surrounding country. And it's not going to stop there. Then they're going to go into neighboring Samaria. This would be the land to the north, which it seems like lifetimes and lifetimes ago was actually part of the United Kingdom under David and under Solomon. These are former Jews, right? The, the, the lost tribes, they're now enemies of us. Well, we're going to go and we're going to be witnesses in Samaria as well. But no, we're not just going to unite the kingdom. It's, it's not just going to stop at the old borders, we could say. It's actually now going to go beyond that. It's going to go to the utmost parts of the earth. To quote Shakespeare, it's going to go into states unborn. It's going to be told in accents yet unknown. And then, having said it all, Jesus is taken up into heaven. This is important to note. He does not leave under his own power. He does not simply jump. He does not levitate himself. He just is taken up. It's a, it's a passive verb on his part. He's being taken up by the Father, back into communion with the Father. He's taken up and a cloud obscures him and he is gone. And we read that the disciples simply stood there not, yeah, once again, not, not being the sharpest or the fastest at following instructions. They stand there. They stand there looking longingly after him. In fact, they stay there for so long that two angelic ministers in white come to comfort them and give them a little, a little push. What do they comfort them with? This is fascinating to me. They comfort them with this promise, this reminder and this promise, that yes, it is true, Jesus is no longer with them, but this is not goodbye so much as it is goodbye for now, because he will return. And he will return in the reverse manner that he just left. He will, in this case, he will return, he will descend with the clouds. And that's a promise. And that, we see, finally not only spurs them to action, but it gives them comfort. If you look at this, uh, the Ascension gets a, um, a cold notes kind of uh, completion at the end of Luke's first gospel. It just says that Jesus spoke to them, he was taken up, and then they went back into the city rejoy uh, joyfully rejoicing and, and ended up spending most of their, I guess, these ten or so days waiting at the temple. So the, the promise, the promise from these messengers not only spurs them to actually go back into the city, but it, it lifts their spirits and lightens their hearts. Ascensions into heaven, wrote Ernest Hemingway. I was surprised to hear this come from him. Ascensions into, quote, ascensions into heaven are like falling leaves, sad and happy at the same time. Going away isn't really sad. 
especially when your going enables a new kind of presence to be born, close quote. And in this, Ernest Hemingway is absolutely correct. The Ascension, I think, is often sorely overlooked, sorely overlooked. I'm not sure if this is uh, particular to Protestantism, but I'm fairly certain that it is overshadowed. It, it tends to suffer, I would say, from middle child syndrome, the Ascension being sandwiched between Easter and Pentecost. And it happens to fall in the middle, and because of the greatness of these two bookends, that it may be inadvertently downplayed or overlooked. Growing up in the church, I mean, I, can, I cannot personally recall getting even more than a passing acknowledgement of it. I mean, we know what happened. We know that at the end of this time, Jesus went to heaven. The end. But as we did with Advent, as, as we've done with so many things in the scripture, I hope to just kind of just take a moment and camp on this for a moment. The ascension is most definitely not to be easily dismissed or overlooked. There is some amazing and integral theology at work here. Let's start with this. What is the, what is the ascension accomplish? What's, what's being accomplished by it? Or is Jesus just leaving for the sake of leaving? That's certainly how it struck the disciples before they got to move on, that he was gone, this, it's over again, we can't function without him, but there was purpose to it. I have four things for you to consider this morning, the things that were accomplished by the ascension. Number one, the ascension marks the end of Jesus' self-limitation. In taking on flesh, there were aspects of his divinity that he self-limited. That all ends today. How do we know that his self-limitation has ended? Because number two, he enters fully into glory. This is what the cloud is all about. We'll look at that shortly. But the cloud is all about him coming into a type of glory. He is in a glorified physical body. We've already looked at that. We've already established that. He is in a, a glorified form, but it's not fully glorified in that people can still look on him and not die. When he ascends into heaven, he now enters into a realm that human eyes can't penetrate. Our frailty, our sinfulness is no longer even a consideration, and so he enters into full glory. That's what the cloud is about. It's not to obscure him. It's much as it is found in the Old Testament, the Shekinah, the melting radiance of God is protected. He, he throws a, it's like when you arc weld. You, you don't look, it's dangerous to look directly at the spark. That's why you wear that face mask. It's for your own protection. The cloud is for the protection of the onlookers. That's how much glory Christ is entering into. Number three, the ascension marks the start of resurrected humanity in heaven. And this is a mind-bending reality to try to, to try to come to grips with. He's not a ghost. He's not leaving as a spirit form. It's not that he casts off the flesh that he has put back on. He goes as he is, which means that he is going into heaven. He is currently in heaven in some type of mysterious and ultimately humanly unknowable physical resurrected form, which gives us great hope. We know that as he is raised to life in a body, so too shall we. And therefore, when we have a body like his, when we too are resurrected in that glorified form, we will be able to go where he is now currently. He has, as we've said previously, blazed a trail for us to follow. Heaven now has an aspect of humanity within it, or it will very, very shortly. It will have an aspect of humanity within it that will change its nature forever and ultimately for the better, because this is going to be a change that is able to act as a bridge. Finally, after all these centuries, Christ now acts as the, to bridge the gulf between the human and the divine by bringing aspects of humanity into the realm of the divine, and vice versa. And fourthly, the ascension accomplishes this. It begins his present work. It begins his present work. Jesus' mission here 
to reconcile all men unto God and to bring them to a saving knowledge of the truth is now complete. It's, it's complete from his point of view it's in, in that it's now being handed off to the earthly church. He's done with it. This is why later on we'll read that he goes into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. This is a direct allusion to what couldn't happen in the earthly temple. There were no chairs in the temple in Jerusalem. There was nowhere for the priests to sit down, and that's because their work of providing sacrifices for the atonement of sins was never finished. It was a morning sacrifice, and then it was an evening sacrifice, and there was no rest day after day, week after week, month after month. It never ended, and that's why it is shocking to the original Jewish audience to read that Christ is not only at, at the hand, the right hand of God the Father, he's seated. Why is he seated? Because his work of sacrificial atonement is finished. The great high priest gets to do what no earthly priest gets to do because the great high priest provided a sacrifice that no one on earth could. So he goes to heaven to sit down and show that his work is complete. However, he doesn't get a lot of rest because the, he then will begin his present work. And what is that, Braden? That is calling out the church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Yes, I knock at your heart. I knock at your conscience. I come with the Holy Spirit to convict you, not to belittle you, but to call you to come out of a dark and sinful life, a dark and sinful world, and into the church to be a member of the ecclesia, the Greek technical term for the church, the study of the church, ecclesia, quite literally, to call out. We are the ecclesia. We are, the church is, the called out ones. We have been called out of sin, called out of a life that was leading us straight into destruction and putting us under God's wrath. So those are four things, four things that are accomplished by the ascension. If he hadn't, hadn't ascended, they would never have been accomplished. His self-limitation would have remained. His glory would not be fully embraced and displayed. Resurrected humanity would not be in heaven. And his present work would be extremely limited. He would, he would not be able to do it. There would be no calling out. Now take a look at verse 2. This is, as we said, the beginning of Luke's account, expanding what he wrote at the end of verse 1. And then at verse 4, this is where the, the story of the ascension really, really gets going. A few things I just want to call to your attention this morning. Look at what Jesus says in verse 4. He's talking about the sending of the Holy Spirit, which, as he says, you have heard me speak about. Really? Did we, Jesus? You've mentioned this before? Yes, he has. Yes, he has. And let me show you where. In Luke 24, this is uh, at verse 49, he said this. He said, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you have endured, uh, until ye be in, imbued, I should say, sorry, until ye be imbued with power from on high. That's the end of Luke. That's the, as I said, the Coles Notes version of this. But Jesus did mention this elsewhere. John 14, actually, for the most of it, the, the after, after dinner discussion, I guess we could call it, of John's account of the Last Supper, you'll find these scattered all throughout chapters 14, 15, and a little bit in chapter 16 in John. I'll save you a lot of page flipping this morning. I've, I've pulled out the highlights for you here. So it's, it's the Last Supper. Judas has left. It's now just Jesus and the faithful 11. And the topic of conversation is turning to Jesus, letting everybody know the lay of the very, very future land, what's going to happen. And in John 14, 16, amongst everything else, he says, Jesus says this. He says, I will pray the Father. And he shall give you another comforter, capital C, it's a proper name, another comforter that he may abide with you forever. A few verses later, this is uh, John 14, 18. He says, I will not, he says, I'm going to go, but, verse 18, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you, verse 26, but the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things, bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. In chapter 15, 26, he continues, he says, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, Jesus will send him. He will send the Comforter you know, with, the, with the involvement of the Father. Even the Spirit of Truth, there's another name for 
for this third person of the Trinity, the Spirit of Truth, which proceedeth from the Father, and he shall testify of me, and ye also shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. And finally, in chapter 16 of John, at, at verse 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. It's, a, it's an excellent question to ask. Why did Jesus have to leave? He's defeated death. He stands before us in a glorified body. It looks as if the disciples are, are even under the impression that this is it. This is, the kingdom is about to be restored. Jesus will stay here in this divine glorified form with all power and authority that he's told us earlier that he's been given. And this, he's, this is it for the Romans. They're out of here, clearly. And the kingdom will be restored. And Israel will once again become the military theocracy that it should never have strayed from previously. We can see this in verse 6, right? It's, and, so, and so the question, why, why would Jesus leave? He had to leave. If he doesn't leave, the Spirit won't come. And we'll see very, very, very shortly why that is critical. See, verse 6, and this is fascinating to me. In the middle of all of this, this amazing promise, Jesus says, I'm going to go, but don't worry. I, I, I will come to you. I will come to you in, through the Spirit. And not only that, it won't just be, oh, Jesus is still with us. That's great. I, I don't feel so sad and alone. It, it, I mean, it will have those aspects, but there, it's also going to come with power. It's going to come with divine power. They're going to become not just disciples, but apostles. They're going to gain an innate authority. They're going to gain supernatural abilities. I mean, it couldn't get any better. And in the midst of this, what do they say? Are you going to now restore the kingdom? Them? right this is it right you're 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 going to restore the kingdom and what are they thinking of just as we said they're thinking of a physical earthly kingdom it's amazing to me because amidst all of this grandioseness they still can't stop being small and human in their thinking and in their expectations and in their wishes they're still thinking literally that he's going to establish an earthly kingdom that he will now deliver them from foreign oppressors and occupiers and verse 7 what does Jesus say he goes oh guys <laughs> guys fine you want to talk about this we'll talk about it. look look at, he dismisses it he dismisses it in a single sentence look it's not for you to know the times so forget about it note this though he doesn't say it's not going to happen he doesn't say it's, it's not going to be a physical earthly kingdom. No, 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 no. He doesn't refute that there will be a reestablishment of the kingdom. He just says, listen, it's not going to happen now. Don't you worry about it. Now, let's get back to what I was talking about. Verse 8 is, an, is subject change, right? Don't worry about the kingdom. Let's get back to what I was talking about because it's actually far more exciting, guys, guys. Back to what we were talking about, the news of the coming of the Spirit and not only its abilities that it's going to grant you, but what it's going to do for my church, which I'm about to start building. You're going to be empowered to not only bringing Jerusalem, but the surrounding countryside and the surrounding lost tribes and then the surrounding nations. He basically gives them here an outline of the entire book of Acts. He gives them a prophetic telling of the church's expansion. This is not just some local event, is what he's saying. The establishment of the kingdom would be great, but it will be a local event. Guys, what I have in store for you, the Father's will is so much bigger than that. It goes beyond local boundaries. It has a global implication. Don't just be fixated on our one little corner of the world. This is going to mark an entirely new kind of kingdom, global in scale, and whose citizens come not just from one elect nation, meaning the Jews, they're going to come from every nation, every creed, every tribe, every language. The, the disciples are, of course, I mean, they're, they're concerned with overthrowing Rome, and that Jesus is going to do it through some kind of divine military action. And yet we'll see at the end of Acts... The church is actually established in Rome itself. They want to eject the Romans. Jesus is saying that with the Holy Spirit, you won't have to eject them. You will affect them. You will affect the entire empire rather than just one or two provinces within it. Also note how this will be done. How will this be done? Witnessing. 
It will all be established through witnessing, not the taking up of arms. It will not be established, this kingdom will not be established through political maneuvering, simply by witnessing. We can say this, the Great Commission is the only growth strategy that the church has ever needed. And if Christians today really want to affect change in our society, we need to focus our efforts on making disciples, baptizing them, and teaching them to obey all that Jesus commanded. The fact that, I mean, as we looked at last week, that less than one in 20 U.S. churchgoers actually know what the Great Commission is, is all you need to explain the rise of things like the moral majority and of Christian political and lobbying parties. Because when the commission is forgotten about, you have to fall back on something. You have to scramble to come up with some kind of replacement strategy. And that just means that you get distracted by fighting a culture war. But see here, it is not, nor has it ever been, the church's mission to redeem the culture or to take control of the political landscape. I know that that might land hard this morning, but it is absolutely true. Scripture backs it up. Jesus never once said that this was going to be the type of kingdom where you have to go out Get your swords. Remember how in the Garden of Gethsemane I told you to drop your swords? Well, now's the time to pick them up. Now's the time to go out there and, and take it by force. Never, never. The Prince of Peace never advocates that. Nor does he say you need to ingrain yourself into the various political parties. Get yourself into the, into the Sanhedrin. Get yourself into the Sadducees so that you can start to affect change that way. No, no, these things are earthly. These are earthly strategies. They work on building earthly kingdoms. And this kingdom is, is beyond any of that. This is a spiritual kingdom. You gotta think spiritually. It is built spiritually. Our business is winning souls, not elections. We are concerned with people not power. Now hear me this morning. Societies and institutions will change. They have changed in the past. Canada's welfare state, our universal health care, this all started with Christians. Christians who strongly believed that the poor and the disenfranchised, the widows, the orphans, yes, they needed to be taken care of. Eventually, of course, these got kind of uploaded, I think is the, the hot term this, for now. They got uploaded to a governmental system. They're now so ingrained in our national identity, people don't know. This would not exist if it was not for the church. So institutions and societies will change, but they will change naturally over time because there will simply be so many Christians operating within them that they will just turn into a Christian organization. They, they won't have they won't have a choice but to do otherwise. A pastor friend of mine once said this years ago. He'll be thrilled that I quoted him. This, <laughs> he said, we don't need to build a Christian society so that we can save people. We need to save people so that we can build a Christian society. See the difference? Now Jesus here is telling the disciples this precise thing. And therefore, this is the message that resounds down through time, through the scripture, to us. He says that the kingdom will be established. He does not refute that. The kingdom will be established. But note, not now and not by you. Sorry, fellas. Not by you. The timing of this is not for them to know. And even if they did know, they wouldn't be able to establish it. Listen, they wouldn't be able to establish the kingdom any more than they are able to catch fish off the left side of the boat if Jesus decrees that all the fish are on the right side of the boat. I'm looking at you, Peter. Remember, you know why you couldn't catch all the fish until I told you where to fish? Because I control the fish. I control everything. All power, all authority has been given unto me from the Father. And that means that the establishment of the kingdom is a matter for who and who alone? Christ. Only the king gets to establish the kingdom. It will happen when the Father deems it will happen, and it will happen with Christ's power, ability, and swords, no one else. And so it is only proper that he now ascends into heaven, if for no other reason than he's going to be a crowned king. 
You have to have a king to establish the kingdom. And he's off to his coronation. And so with that promise, that this promise that very soon the Holy Spirit will come and that they will take over, as it were, the missionary work that Jesus has begun, there's nothing left to say. And he ascends into heaven. And as we read, the disciples stare after him. I mean, long after he's vanished from sight. Angels have to come and give them prompting. These two men in white. Two men in white. Note that this is the exact same description used of the figures that greeted the women at the empty tomb. Angelic messengers, clearly. They appear and they tell them that Jesus will return in just this same way. This return, this uh, second coming. It's a bit of a strange term. It actually infers that he has left us entirely, but he hasn't. He's just not as close to us. Scripture gives us a little further detail about what this return, what this coming will be like. Why does it do that? So that we can take heart, just as the disciples did, and know that no matter what life may seem like, no matter how much of an uphill battle it all seems, this carrying out of the commission, it will end well. In his loving mercy, Jesus spoils the ending so that you always have something to look forward to. Look at it did to the disciples. All of a sudden, there's not staring longingly after Jesus anymore. It's, all right, let's, let's do what he said. Let's go into the city. Let's, I can't wait to see what's going to happen in the very short number of days. Let me just quickly direct you to 1 Thessalonians 4. 1 Thessalonians 4, where this return is given a little more detail. Paul writes this for the, in verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord Wherefore, verse 18, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Take solace in the fact that you know how it ends, and it ends well for us. And this, of course, describes the rapture, the rapture. From the Latin raptus, the interesting word actually means to take or seize, but in particular, it's a legal term talking about the division of property and who properly owns what. During the rapture, Christ is going to literally seize that which is his and take it home. Why is he going to do that? Because, 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. We are not appointed to suffer what's about to happen, and what's about to happen will be the wrath of God. It will be a baptism of judgmental fire moments away, and commencing upon the rest of fallen humanity. Second Thessalonians, I, I haven't got time to go into it all this morning. I wish I did. Second Thessalonians 2 lets us know that there will be some preliminary things to look for before Christ's return. But nonetheless, it is always described as a thief in the night. It will appear suddenly. It will come with a trumpet shout. It's always described as unmissable. No one in the world will be able to say, I had no idea this was happening, right? They will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, we read in Mark 13, 26. Christ will return in clouds just as clouds have embraced him at the ascension, meaning he will return in the Shekinah glory. It will be absolutely unmissable, hence the references to trumpet sounds. And voices like archangels heard around the globe. And for those of us who call him Lord, those of us who groan for this day of redemption along with all the rest of creation, this is the promise that gives us hope and perseverance, just as it should fill everybody else with conviction and with dread. But doubtless, the disciples, as they stared up into the sky and wondered why Jesus had to leave them in the first place, I mean, as we've already said, couldn't, couldn't he have stayed here? Well, no, he couldn't. Otherwise, the Holy Spirit wouldn't have come. But I have, just in conclusion, I, just to wrap this up, I have a few more reasons why he had to go, why the ascension had to happen. We've looked at what it accomplished, but there's more as well. Let me, let me give you some of these. He had to leave to go and prepare a place in heaven for every one of us. I go now to prepare a place for you. 
Right? In my father's mansion, there are many rooms. I go to prepare a place now. Well, if he doesn't leave, a place can't be prepared for us. He also had to go to be in the Father again. That's John 14, 11. He had to return home, much like the prodigal son. That's what popped into my head. Except, unlike a broken and convicted and sinful son, this is a son returning maybe weary, maybe battle-weary, as one commentator said, but triumphant from the war. And in this case, the father comes to embrace him and say, well done, come and sit. You've earned a... He also had to go so that the disciples and all other believers that would follow after him, John 14, 12, would do great works. If Christ had stayed, what part would we play? What, what would there be for us to do that he couldn't? It would, uh, it would make our relationship with God awfully lopsided if we had no partnership not only in our sanctification, but in the saving of others. If we just sat back and it all happened around us, it would be incredibly sad. So he left so that the work could be handed over to us. As we've said, he left so that the Spirit would come. And I, I want you to consider this this morning. I had not for a long time. Without the Spirit, there are no fruits of the Spirit. If Christ doesn't leave, the Spirit doesn't come. If the Spirit doesn't come, listen to this. If the Spirit doesn't come, there's no charity in us. There's no joy, no peace, no patience, no goodness, no mildness, no faith. There's no faith without the Spirit. Whatever we have will be human and empty, and we will be unable to bring anyone else to a faith, a saving faith. If Jesus doesn't leave, nobody gets saved. There's no self-control. If he doesn't leave and the Spirit comes, there's no chastity. Without the Spirit, even the most repentant sinner, even the most repentant sinner, cannot be divinely regenerated into a new creature unless the Spirit comes. Without the Spirit, there is no second birth. Without the second birth, there is no reconciling to God. Without the Spirit, we would never be taught all things. We would never be able to provide a true testimony, John 15, 26. I like to think this, as they were standing on the Mount of Olives, that Thomas, Thomas knew best, since we've looked at him previously. Thomas knew best why Jesus had to depart, because he, of all the disciples, knew that blessed are those who believe without seeing the world would be a very religious place if Christ were still physically in it, but it would be faithless. Churches would be packed, but nobody would be saved. And thus, Christ has to leave for all of these reasons. He has to go to accomplish the things we've left out. But there's one more thing, one more reason that he had to go. He had to go, as I said earlier, because his first ministry is now complete and another is about to begin. Having shed his blood for the remission of sins, he now goes to appear before the Father and do what? Thank you, author of Hebrews, Hebrews 9, 24. He now stands before the Father to intercede on behalf of all believers. If he didn't go, he couldn't do this. What do you mean by intercede? If you back up a chapter or two, Hebrews 7, 25, he must now, here's, here's, a, here's a description of what Christ goes to do and is doing now. He goes to save those who approach God through him since he lives forever to make intercession for them. As we've said, he is now the bridge between the Godhead and humanity. We can't get there except through him. So he better go there. He holds open the door. He enters the Holy of Holies where we can't. He pleads our case when we have no excuse. He covers us with a righteousness that we can never achieve ourselves. But in order for all of this to be effectual, he has to stand before the throne of God and therefore he has to go. He has to return to the Father's heavenly throne room because great changes are about to be enacted there. And that 
I unfortunately have to leave for next week when we will look at what happens on the heavenly side of the ascension. <laughs>